Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Cornerstone Faith Community Church. We are so glad that you have joined us for worship on this third Sunday in the season of Lent. Let's stand together this morning as we gather our hearts with these words from Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom should I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to ask him in his, and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock.
Isaiah 53, 1 through 6. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all.
God, you are our good and gracious King. Father, you love us unconditionally. Father, you love us even in the midst of our sin. Father, time and time again, we're reminded of that passage in Scripture that at exactly the right moment, even while we were still sinning, you saw fit to let your grace abound to us. You gave us Jesus Christ, your Son, as a full atonement to pay the debt of our sin. Jesus paid it all for us. Even while we were still sinning, you are a good and gracious king. You are the best, most gracious king. We have no one better than you. And so, Father, we thank you this morning. We come now, Father, and we lay our sin before you. We recognize that we have strayed from your way. We have sinned against you. We have sinned against one another. We so desperately need your forgiveness, Father. And that's why we're here. We're here to lay it all before you, to get real about our sin, to worship and praise you. For you alone, Father, can make us whole. You alone can clean us. Because you alone are the good and gracious King. So, Father, now will you send your Holy Spirit into this place to hover over us, to govern our words and our thoughts and our actions in this place. May the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. And let the church cry out, amen. Well, good morning. And welcome once again to Cornerstone Faith Community Church. We are so glad to be gathered with you this morning. If you are here for Sunday school this morning, would you make your way to the back of the sanctuary? Our teachers are ready and excited to meet with you. And what a great day it is to be gathered together with you all for worship on this spring-like day. I see lots of light colors in the uh, congregation this morning. I think that's because folks are ready for this 70-degree day we're going to have today, right? Yeah, what a, what a good and gracious king we have that he gave us a 70-degree day in March, right? Uh, and that's incredible. Well, we are so glad to be gathered with you this morning. Let me share a few things that are happening in the life of the church. Uh, don't forget that next week, Sunday, March 10th, is uh, time to change time and spring forward. Um, I know you're very excited about that. Everyone, <laughs> well, everyone loves to lose an hour of sleep, but everybody loves the extra daylight. So there is that. Although, you know, I was saying to Sarah, it's, so, it's been so great because we get up early. Our, week, our day starts early. So it's been fantastic. It's already light out. But now, starting next Monday, it's going to be dark again. <laughs> so, um, but... Don't forget to change your clocks next week. Uh, otherwise, we're going to have church without you. Um, also, coming up uh, at the end of this week, Saturday, uh, is our Saturday breakfast study. That starts at 8.30 a.m. We hope that you will come and join us for a hot breakfast. Um, we are going to do breakfast pizzas uh, for you guys. So I hope that that's, maybe that's something you haven't had before, but uh, we're very excited to do breakfast pizza. And uh, the Italian folks in the uh, crowd right now are looking at me like, well, really? Um, but it's good, I promise. Um, we're going to have breakfast pizza and some other things with it. It'll be a very fun time of study, fellowship, just a great way to start your Saturday morning. Please join us in the Beacon Room this Saturday at 8.30 a.m. 
Also, coming up in, in just a, week, a couple weeks, Saturday, uh, March 16th, uh, beginning at 6 p.m. is our next movie night. We will be watching Faith Like Potatoes, um, which is a great movie about uh, perseverance through very difficult times. Um, don't forget that we make our own movie theater downstairs in the Welcome Center, so please bring uh, a camping chair or a lawn chair or something of that nature. Uh, some folks just spread out blankets on the floor. Last time, that works too. Don't forget, it's a concrete floor under that very thin carpet, so think about that. But um, it is a fun time. There is no cost for admission to the movie. Uh, if you would like to purchase... Um, dinner from the concession stand. There is a, a small fee for those things, but in comparison to the actual movie theater, you will find that the cost is very minimal. That is uh, Saturday, March 16th at 6 p.m. And then uh, we want to remind you that we have a full slate of um, Holy Week uh, worship services that are special opportunities, beginning with Palm Sunday, Sunday, March 24th, um, will be our pancake breakfast, our annual pancake breakfast that will be served by our council uh, and some of our staff members. Uh, that will take place in the Beacon Room beginning at 8.30 a.m. We'll have pancakes before we come to church. Yes, I know I'm taking a risk. We're going to feed you and then expect you to stay awake. But uh, we are going to have pancakes and sausage and fruit, um, coffee, juice. Um, it's a great breakfast. It is free will donation. Folks, this is really, truly a fantastic opportunity to invite neighbors, friends, relatives to come and say, hey, I'll, I'll buy you breakfast. It's a free will donation. Um, but it's really what we have found. The reason we do this on Palm Sunday instead of Easter is two reasons. One, people have lots of plans on Easter. Two, it is a great catalyst to encourage folks to come back on Easter Sunday. So um, please consider who you might invite to come for Palm Sunday, to join us for pancake breakfast, and then uh, to stick around for the worship service. Um, just a quick heads up, we don't have slides for it this week, but we do also have a Good Friday service. That is our uh, dramatic presentation that will take place at 7 p.m. on Good Friday here in the sanctuary. Um, and then we do have our Easter um, celebration gathering that takes place at 10 a.m. on Easter morning. So it, we have a full slate of Holy Week opportunities for you. Palm Sunday. On Palm Sunday, we will have gluten-free and, um, what were the other things? Dairy-free. Dairy-free, the, the gluten-free ones are gluten-free and dairy-free. So, um, yes, we will have those. Any other announcements this morning? Okay. Um, at this time, I am very excited to say that we have new members to receive uh, as part of our church family this morning. So if the eight folks who are here to uh, join the family this morning would come on down and join me up here, you are the next contestants at Cornerstone. I'm, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm going to have you guys stand right behind the pulpit if you don't mind so everybody can see you. As long as I don't have to jump rope, I'm all right. Can, can, I, can I help you up here? Yes. Okay. Thank you. You bet. We'll just have everybody make a line if we can. Thank you, Pastor. You bet. Now, before I get started, I have to tell you something that I have, I have combed the, the spider webs of my brain. I don't think that we have had eight new members at one time since I have become pastor of this church. Can we give... Oh, hold on a second. Time out. What? Oh, all the kids. That's, you're right. Maybe so. But it's still worth a shout to the Lord. Yes. <laughs> so, beloved in the Lord, God has called us to gather together in this place and at this time for the purpose of receiving new members into this, his family, called together as the congregation of Cornerstone Faith Community Church at Bloomingdale, Illinois. 
In the gospel of John chapter 13 and verse 34, Jesus spoke these words to us. He said, a new commandment I give to you that you would love one another just as I have loved you, so you are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And so it is in the spirit of these words then that we gather together to receive these brothers and sisters in the love of Jesus Christ, our Lord. So, Bob and Enza, Dale and Shirley, Matt and Johanna, and Rick and Cynthia. You now come to take upon yourself the responsibilities, the rights, and the privileges of full membership in this Christ church, gathered together at Bloomingdale, Illinois, and called together as Cornerstone Faith Community Church. So I now require you to affirm your commitment to God Christ Jesus and his church by answering the following questions. Do you affirm your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and desire from this day forward to be his disciple? If so, please answer, I do. do. And do you promise to give yourself in holy obedience to the service of God in Christ Jesus through this, his church, and wherever else the opportunity might present itself? If so, please answer, I do. And do you promise to be loyal to your church, faithful in your obligations to her, giving honor in all things to God in Christ, and not to covet these things for yourself? If so, please answer, I do. do. And do you accept the congregational form of government of your church? And will you be governed by her rules and her regulations insofar as you are able? If so, please answer, I do. And do you intend to regularly attend the public services of worship of your church, to support your church with your substance, to engage in private devotion, and to increase your knowledge of the Christian faith and the administration of your church? If so, please answer, I do. do. Having then heard your profession of faith and your intention in commitment to this church, I now extend to you the right hand of Christian fellowship and receive you into this body, Christ Church, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. All right, so there's yours. Welcome. Right. Let's give a shout of praise to the Lord. Would you please join me in a word of prayer? Father, we do so thank you for this group of new members to our family. Lord, we thank you that this is indeed a family that you have knit together, that you are constantly knitting together and that these are just new stitches in this family. Lord, as we continue to grow, we pray that you will help us to come to know one another better, that you will help us to love one another better, that you will help us to share with one another and support one another in times of need and in times of abundance. And Father, we thank you for the many, many ways that we share fellowship together. But mostly, Father, we thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ that we have in common. The blood that has saved us from our sin. And so, Father, now we ask that you will be with these new members, that you will give them courage and strength to share the name of Jesus and to be a part of this family. Lord, together we are strong. We are always better together. And so, Father, we thank you for growing us today. We give you all of this in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. Welcome, everybody. You can make it back to your seats. I can help you down. (laughs) Oh, careful.
That's good. Yeah. All right. Anybody need any? You bet. Matt. You bet. Well, in your bulletins this morning, you will also find a prayer list. We do thank you for praying for those folks throughout this week. Um, and we ask that you would uh, place that someplace where you will see that on a regular basis. And you can be praying alongside us um, this week for those folks. Again, we'll just remind you that if you should happen to have a request to add to that, you can do that by either writing it down and putting it in the tithe box or emailing us at the church office or calling us at the church office. Uh, but would you please uh, join me in a general word of prayer this morning? Father, we now humbly submit ourselves once again before you and we submit before you each of these prayer requests. Lord, knowing that before we've even spoken them to you, you have known these needs. For you are indeed the great physician, the great healer, the great comforter, and the great provider, Jehovah Jireh. But Father, we are still called as your people to submit these petitions before you that you might be blessed with the opportunity to hear us and to answer us. And so, Father, we lay them before you now. We humbly bow our heads and our hearts and our knees before you. We ask that you would hear each of these names, that you would be working for them. Heal the sick. Comfort those who are in distress. Bring peace to those who mourn. Provide for those who have need. And Father, this morning, as we continue to look at our series, Sackcloth and Ashes, as we continue to consider the condition of our sinful hearts before you, the perfect and wonderful God, we ask, Father, that you would once again show us where we have strayed from you, that you would call all sinners back to you, that we might be made clean once again. So, Father, now, as we turn our hearts to your word, will you give us again the wisdom and discernment of the Holy Spirit in this place? that this word would fall fresh on us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, as you are able, would you please stand for the reading of God's word this morning? This morning we turn to the words of 2 Samuel chapter 12 beginning at verse 1. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word for this day. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb that he had bought. He raised it. It grew up with him and his children. It shared its food, drank from his cup, even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all Israel and Judah. And if this had, not been, if this had been too little, I would have given you even more. 
Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Amorites. Now therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. This is what the Lord says, out of your household, I am going to bring calamity on you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to one who is close to you and he will sleep with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. And David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. But because by doing this, you have shown utter contempt for the Lord, the son born to you will die. And after Nathan had gone home, the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife had born to David, and he became ill. And David pleaded with God for the child. He fasted, and he spent nights lying in sackcloth on the ground. The elders of this household stood beside him to get him up from the ground, but he refused, and he would not eat any food with them. On the seventh day, the child died. David's attendants were afraid to tell him that the child was dead, for they thought, while the child was still living, he wouldn't listen to us when we spoke to him. How can we now tell him that the child is dead? He may do something desperate. David noticed that his attendants were whispering among themselves, and he realized that the child was dead. Is the child dead, he asked. Yes, they replied, he is dead. Then David got up from the ground. After he had washed, he put on lotions and changed his clothes. He went into the house of the Lord and he worshiped. Then he went to his own house and at his request, they served him food and he ate. His attendants asked him, why are you asking this way? While the child was alive, you fasted and wept. But now that the child is dead, you get up and eat. He answered, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. I thought, who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me and let the child live. But now that he is dead, why should I go on fasting? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him. He will not return to me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Well, brothers and sisters, a young boy in the late 1950s wanted nothing more than to convince his parents to purchase a new bicycle for him. Now, in the 1950s, there was no more popular bicycle brand, at least, than Schwinn. And at that time, there was no more sought-after bicycle than the Schwinn American Bicycle. The young boy was determined he had to have one, so he set out on the arduous journey of convincing his otherwise fiscally conservative parents that a a wise investment would be to spend $49.95 on his dream bicycle. Now, to put the boy's request into modern perspective, accounting for inflation and amortization, asking for a bicycle that cost $49.95 in 1950 was equivalent or would be equivalent to asking for a bicycle that costs $649.89 today. The boy's request was no small ask. But his desire for a Schwinn American bicycle was stronger than ever, so he began doing all of the normal things that a young boy in the 50s would do to gently drop the hint that he wanted this bicycle. He might like to have this bike. For instance, he just happened to leave his most recent copy of Boy's Life magazine opened to this Schwinn advertisement. On his bed... As he left for school every single day for a week straight. When he was with his mother at the grocery store, he happened to notice a headline on the front cover of Women's World magazine about the need for children to have fresh air and outdoor exercise. So he accidentally knocked a copy of the magazine off the newsstand and hoping his mother might have to pick it up. The young boy went so far as to let 
nearly all of the air out of the back tire of his current bicycle in an effort to demonstrate his desperate need for something newer and safer. Then, one afternoon, after finishing playing baseball, he was walking home with his neighborhood buddies, and a friend asked the young boy a question that completely changed his course of thinking about his desire for this bicycle. The young boy said, Rather than trying to just suggest to your parents that you would like to have this bicycle, did you ever think about just asking them for the bicycle? The young boy's immediate response was defensive. He says, I could never do that. They'll just say it's too expensive, and that will be the end of the discussion. But his friend replied, well, you've been dropping hints all summer long. Nothing has happened. You never know. They might surprise you and they might actually buy you this bike. Later that evening, after the dinner table had been cleared and all of the dishes had been washed and put away, the young boy asked his parents if he could talk with them. He sat down across the kitchen table from them which in that moment felt more like the Grand Canyon than the kitchen table. And he finally mustered the courage to ask his parents for this new bicycle. To his astonishment, this was his father's reply. Well, I had no idea you would like to have a new bike. Perhaps this Saturday we could take a drive down to the hardware store and take a look at the options that they have. Brothers and sisters, sometimes life's most troubling matters boil down to nothing more than finding the courage necessary to ask a simple question. Sometimes life's most troubling matters boil down to nothing more than finding the courage necessary to ask a simple question. For example, there is a family who is at risk of losing their home because they are behind on their mortgage payments. No one in their family is any the wiser because a man's pride prevents him from being able to ask anybody for help. An elderly woman suffered a catastrophic fall because she simply didn't want to bother her children and ask them to help shovel off her front steps. A new college freshman ends up with three blisters on their feet from walking four miles to the nearest drugstore rather than mustering up the courage necessary to make a friend and ask for a ride. When it comes to the matter of our sin, and in particular, when it comes to the matter of confessing our sin to God, so often people cast off the idea of going to God and repenting their sin because after all, God, who is so perfect, how could he ever overlook our sin? King David has a powerful message for folks who feel this way about their sin. This morning he said, who knows? The Lord might be gracious. Who knows indeed? The Lord might be gracious. In fact, God in his very own words to us reminds us that in every situation he has every intention of being that exact thing. For example, Psalm 145 verse 8 says that the Lord is that thing. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. But here's the difficulty that we have to wrestle with today, brothers and sisters. How can we ever begin to hope that God might be gracious to us if we have never actually laid out our desperate plea before him? 
And even more to our point today, how can we be sure that the Lord God has actually heard our desperate plea if we have not set ourselves apart and made our desires known to him? In much the same way that that young boy's father reacted to the request for that bicycle by saying, listen, I had no idea that you would like to have a new bicycle. It is entirely conceivable that this following scenario could happen. On the last day, when a person is called to stand before God and stand accountable for his actions or her actions in her life, when God passes down his judgment for their actions, it is entirely reasonable to expect that every person would beg, perhaps even plead for mercy. At that moment, I would bet that even an atheist would prefer the grace of God to the pits of hell. But it would stand to reason, would it not? That in some cases, God may have the very same response as the father in the bicycle story. Oh, I had no idea you even wanted grace. You surely never asked me for it. It is inevitable, brothers and sisters, that we will sin. It is inevitable that we will sin, but it is imperative that we must ask God to forgive that sin. In our text for this morning, as we see yet another instance of sackcloth and ashes being played out in God's word, we come to this time when King David, the king of Israel, he, um, well, it's going to come as no surprise to you, I think. David has recently been party to sin with another man's wife. Anybody surprised? No, I didn't think so. Her name is Bathsheba. And unfortunately, as sin so often goes, that first level sin led to an even greater sin. And when David tried to cover up his indiscretion, he ultimately then leads to another sin, murder. Murder of Bathsheba's husband, Uriah. Sometime later, the Lord sends the prophet Nathaniel to the king. Nathaniel's only task is to call King David's attention to his sin. Nathaniel reminds King David that God had anointed him king over all of Israel, and he had delivered him from the hand of that nasty king Saul, whose only intention was to kill him. And it was God, Nathaniel reminded him, that had given King David his kingdom and his house and his monarchy. And if all of this hadn't been enough, God's word tells us. God would have readily given him even more. But now the king has despised it all by doing what is evil in the sight of the Lord. He's taken another man's wife as his own. He has killed her husband to cover it up. Now, if you guys can remember all the way back to last Sunday for just a second, when we talked about Joseph, remember Joseph, the coat of many colors, and his brothers, especially when we talked about Reuben, the eldest brother of Joseph, who was made aware that Joseph wasn't in the cistern anymore, and so Reuben tore his clothes immediately. Reuben was confronted with his sin. The first reaction was utter utter despair. He couldn't believe what he had done. Today we see a similar reaction from King David. David doesn't immediately tear his robe, but he does immediately recognize his sin. He simply states this. He says, I have sinned against the Lord. I have sinned against the Lord. Now, when David is presented with the information and the consequence of what his sin will be, the death of his newborn son He does change his clothes. He goes into his royal bedroom. He takes off his royal robes. He puts on the sackcloth. God's word tells us that he fasted and he spent the night laying in sackcloth on the ground. Even the elders and the chief of priests could not get David up off of the ground from his deep mourning and regret. When David is presented with the news that his son has now died, he finally then gets up off the ground. He goes back into his chambers. He puts his royal clothes back on. And one of his attendants then says, Oh, hold on, King David. That don't make any sense. 
while your son was alive, you laid on the ground in sackcloth. You mourned for him while he was living. Now that he's dead, you put your royal robes back on as if you're not even mourning? Isn't that backwards? David's response is a powerful one. It speaks volumes to you and I about the situation of our sin as much as it does to David's own sin. David said this. He said, while the child was still alive, I fasted and I wept. I thought, who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me and let the child live. But now that he is dead, why should I go on fasting? I will go to him. He will not return to me. David was absolutely right. If there was any hope that God might let this little child live, it would only happen because David finally got serious about the sin that brought him to this place in the first place. But God's will was not to forgive David's sin in that manner. I mean, listen. Just because the child didn't live doesn't mean that God didn't forgive David's sin, by the way. God definitely heard David's plea. He did forgive David's sin. God did give David another son by Bathsheba. By the way, that son would go on to become the next king of Israel, Solomon the Great. But God is a God who has to keep his word. He cannot lie. Remember what Romans 6.23 says? The wages of sin is death. But that didn't stop David from doing what he knew he had to do. And what a display for a king to put on. He took off his royal robes. He put on cloth associated with everything that a king is not supposed to be. And he made himself vulnerable. He laid prostrate on the ground before God and he wept over the sin that brought him to this moment. The sin that cost him the life of his son. And he did it all because, well, who knows? The Lord might be gracious. So this morning I want to quickly offer you three powerful reminders from David's sackcloth moment for us. And the first one is this. Our God is oftentimes the God of surprising grace. Our God is oftentimes the God of surprising grace. What David had hoped that his time in the sackcloth would accomplish was saving the life of his newborn son. That wasn't God's plan. However, the surprising grace of God The surprising grace that God had in store for David was twofold. First, that God would permit David to go on living in spite of, as God's word said, utterly despising God's word. The second surprising grace moment for David was that God would give David this second son with Bathsheba. And then that God would go so far as to make that second son the next king of Israel and that he would be Solomon the Great. You see, oftentimes God's grace is a complete and unexpected surprise to us. In Romans chapter 5, this truth is proven to us twice. First, verses 7 through 8, we read that very rarely will someone die for a righteous person. But sometimes people are willing to die for good people. Now, here's the surprising part of all of that. It says, when it comes to God, just at the right exact time, while you and I were still sinning, Christ died for us. We were neither righteous nor good. We were still sinning. And Christ died for us. Not because we were good, not because we were righteous, but because he, what does John 3, 16 tells us? So loved us. That's surprising grace. Secondly, in verse 10, we read that while we were God's enemies, he reconciled us to him through the death of his son. So not only while we were still sinning did Jesus die for us, but while we were God's enemies, he reconciled us to him. To which we must be completely stopped dead in our tracks and ask this, Why? Why? 
why. When we were God's enemies, he reconciled himself to us. In other words, not at the moment when we were just unaware of him or we didn't know about him or, or, or we forgot about him, but the moment when we hated him. He died for us. The moment when we were outright against him, God set about his plan to bring us back home with him. So those words from the opening of John's gospel, they really ring true for us, don't they? John 1, 11 and 12, where it says, he came to his own, but his own received him not. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. His own couldn't even be bothered to receive the incredible gift the Father was giving to them, and yet that didn't stop the surprising grace of God. Now, I understand that this morning, much of what I am saying may not directly apply to some of you, because you have already experienced the surprising grace of God. Frankly, you're not so much surprised when God meets you in those terrible moments with his grace, his love, and his mercy. But there may well be some seated here this morning who are still getting used to God showing up in the middle of those moments with his grace. And what's more, it is always helpful for all of us to be reminded that, as the word says, neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So sometimes God's grace surprises us, but brothers and sisters, that is all the more reason that we should be eager to put on the sackcloth and the ash and to sit before the Lord and declare our sin because who knows? We might be surprised again when God shows up and unconditionally loves us again. Second powerful reminder from David's sackcloth moment for us is this. When we confess our sin, God takes away our sin. But sin forever changes our earthly lives. When we confess our sin, God takes away our sin, but sin forever changes our earthly lives. I want you to notice three things about King David's sin situation. First, he recognized his sin. In terms of our message series, he's actually done what I've been asking us to do, hasn't he? He took his sin seriously. Second thing I want you to notice, he changed his clothes. He took off his royal robes. He put on the sackcloth. He fasted. He prayed. He went before the Lord with his sin. Again, in terms of what I've been asking of us in this message series, David took his sin seriously. The third thing, though, that I want you to see is God's response. God's response to David wasn't the response David wanted to hear. David was hoping that God would change his mind. He would let his infant son live. Instead, this was God's response. God said, David, you will not die. But because by doing this, you have shown utter contempt for the Lord, the son born to you will die. When God said, you will not die, we have to hear and interpret those words as God saying, David, I forgive you. Now you might say, that doesn't sound much like an acceptance of David's repentance to me. But when we put that statement into the context of others of God's statements, I think you'll see what I mean. Because remember I said, Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death. So when God said, David, you will not die, that's clearly God saying, I forgive you. David should have died for this sin, but God, but God in his ever 
increasing love. God in his never ceasing mercy and grace. God saw fit to give David his life back. David was not deserving of that life. His actions deserved the consequence of death. But God, who is merciful and long suffering with his people, saw fit to truly give mercy to this repentant sinner. And yeah, brothers and sisters, I get it. It stinks to high heaven that David had to lose this son because of his sin. But God cannot lie. He cannot go back on his word. The wages of sin is death, always death. So in order to give David his life back, others, somebody had to lose a life. But I want you to know this. Romans 6.23 doesn't end on those words, the wages of sin is death. There's more to it. Paul concludes that statement by reminding us that while our sin costs us death, it is the gift of God to exchange that death for eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. And so now hopefully you can begin to see that the work of Jesus Christ is coming to fruition for us. Our sin deserves death. We have no business expecting to go on living like we do. The only reason we have any hope for life is the exact same reason that David had any hope for life. But God. When we truly repent of our sin, God steps in. Jesus steps in. Jesus' death becomes our death. And praise God. Subsequently, Jesus' life becomes our life. We sin. Somebody's got to die. God loved us enough to offer Jesus in our place. So when we confess our sin, God absolutely takes away our sin. What stood between us and our perfect God no longer stands between us anymore, but that does not erase the earthly impact of that sin. God's grace fixes us. Our sinful actions, however, still hurt others around us. Our words still sting. Our actions still disappoint. Our sin still has consequences. Sin can be gone, but it is almost never forgotten. Sin changes our earthly lives forever. David sinned. Bathsheba lost a husband. David sinned. Uriah lost a wife. David sinned. David and Bathsheba lost a son. Sin forever changes our earthly lives. Final point for this morning. There is a common occurrence in Scripture. God gives us grace in the midst of our darkest moments. God gives us grace in the midst of our darkest moments. I was recently speaking with someone who is experiencing a time of great sadness in their life. This time is filled with grief at the loss of a loved one, as well as being complicated by major stressors in their life, difficult family dynamics, and just an overwhelming feeling of exhaustion. Yet in the middle of that incredibly trying moment of losing someone, this person shared with me at least three, maybe more, instances where they were able to see God working and moving, providing gifts, providing signs everywhere they went that indeed God was in control of even this dark moment. Sometimes, brothers and sisters, we put God in too small of a box. Sometimes we only think of God's grace as him forgiving us. But he gives us, scripture tells us, grace upon grace, grace in excess of grace, grace that is all sufficient for every moment in our lives. And so, since the very definition of grace is God giving that to us which we do not deserve, even moments like this friend of mine was experiencing where God made his presence known to them so powerfully in the midst of a dark time of losing a loved one. Well, that too is 
grace. Time and time again in God's word, we see evidence of God giving grace in the midst of the darkest hour. Psalm 9, 9 tells us that God intends to be a refuge for those who find themselves in trouble. Psalm 46 and 1 tells us that God is our refuge, our strength. He is a very present help in times of trouble. Psalm 55 and 2 says, cast your burdens and your troubles on the Lord. Why? Because he cares for you. And Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, come to me, all you who are burdened and heavy laden, for I will give you rest. God has this uncanny habit of showing up right smack in the middle of our darkest moments exactly when we need him. But I want you to notice what I just said. He comes to us with exactly what we need. Not what we deserve. For we could never truly be deserving of what God gives us in the midst of those moments. Nor could we ever be deserving of his presence with us, nor of his good gifts to us. But God, but God still shows up. He meets us in the middle of our darkest days, even while we are still sinning. He comes equipped with grace and mercy enough to sustain us and to see us through every trial. James chapter 4 reminds us that our friendship with this world only means enmity with God. In other words, when we care more about what this world says, what this world thinks of us, than what God thinks of us, We cause a greater separation between us and God. But that's on us. James reminds us that God remains jealous for a relationship with us. He created us to have a relationship with him. He wants it that way. And so James 4, 5, I'm going to leave you with that today. It says, Or do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has created to dwell in us? Why is God so jealous for you? Why does God want you to come back to him, to dwell with him in that relationship that he created you to have with him? James answers that very question in verse six, the very next verse. It says, because he gives us more grace. If we need more grace, God gives us more grace. When we need more grace, God gives us more grace. Because we need more grace, God gives us more grace. In our darkest moments, in our deepest sins, if we will only turn away from that sin and turn back to God, if we will take off the worldly clothes and for once in our life put on the sackcloth and lay before him, If we will spend a night in sackcloth and ash, he will meet us again and surprise us yet again with more grace. Because our God is the God of surprising grace who takes away our sin and replaces it with yet more grace. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the example of King David. Might seem even crazy to suggest that King David is an example after we look at his life and the things that he has done. But which one of us, Father, hasn't? Which one of us hasn't sinned? Which one of us hasn't given up everything for a moment's pleasure, for a rash decision, for a foolish decision? Father, help us Help us to go into our rooms to take off these worldly clothes, to put on sackcloth, and to spend the night before you. 
to confess our sin, to lay it all out, God, and leave nothing behind that you might cleanse us from all of it. For there is nothing that we should hide from you because you are the God of surprising grace. That even while we are still sinning, you have seen fit to give us Jesus Christ as our Savior. So Father, help us to present ourselves to you in sackcloth. that we might have our but God moment too. We ask this in your name. As we call to you from the deepest, darkest sorrows, Father, hear us. Amen. Will you please stand and sing with us?
Well, brothers and sisters, as we go from this place this morning out of the deep sorrows of our hearts, out of the ways that this world rips us apart, out of the sinfulness that this world drags us into, cry out to God. Lay before him all of that. Because as David said, who knows? The Lord may be gracious. In fact, brothers and sisters, we can answer that question, can't we? We don't need to say who knows. We do know. The Lord will be gracious. So grow, brothers and sisters, with the love of God our Father, the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, and the power and presence of the Holy Spirit to be yours this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. This morning, we have a small reception for all of our new members. If you can just give us a few seconds. For the